Okay. I think we're there. Um, so, as usual, everything is out of sync and confusing. Um, but uh, it's life. It's life. Hello, my friends. Friends, foes, and French fries. Good to have you with me. I'm Tad. I'm going to be reading and just sort of generally hanging out. Um, we had another another uh, technology crisis last night. This one was my fault. Um, I was about 40 minutes or so into the uh, into the reading for the late night crowd, and uh, because I'm having to now use two pieces of two software windows at the same time, um, as opposed to just one, which is all I had to do in the past. I'm flipping back and forth between them because I no longer get comments and chat and stuff like that on the um, the page I'm I'm uh, I'm using the page I'm 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 on. So I have to go back to the Facebook page to try and find out you know people who are on you know say hello to people etc. Um, this is constantly problematic for various reasons. Um, not only because I cannot see the comments in real time, but because the weirdness of Facebook, I still haven't figured out, after years of being on Facebook, I cannot figure out how to get it to display comments in the way that I want it to. I don't think it does. I don't think it's possible, but I will try and do put some more research into it. But anyway, so flipping back and forth between these two, I accidentally hit the end stream button, which in and of itself was not the end of the world. I just was going to, you know, I was just, it's pretty obvious to everybody on the other end, so I was just going to start it over. And, uh, but for some reason, it was showing me as still live, and I couldn't get back. I think now, in retrospect, I might have been able to log out entirely out of Facebook, log back in, and make it work, but I don't know. Um, but as it was, I had, you know, 15 minutes left in the or in the reading or whatever, and by the time I even started to get to the point where I realized that it was not going to let me back on and not let me restart my stream, uh, that sounds like a medical problem, doesn't it? Wouldn't let me restart my stream. Anyway, by the time that I got back to figuring out, okay, I might have to do this, it was like, you know, there was no time left and there was no point to it. So again, for those watching this, uh, especially those who are on the 1 a.m. broadcast, I, I apologize deeply. It's so embarrassing and so irritating um, that these things happen, but, you know, whatever. We'll see if we can solve them and make them better somehow. In the interim, uh, we're all basically doing okay here. Um, I am working away on Navigator's Children. I broke the back to use a very violent metaphor, I broke the back of chapter 31, which was killing me there for several days, um, and uh, then just zipped through chapter 32 today. So um, this, this, these are rewrites, um, but some of them are difficult and some of them are not. And I think fortunately most of the rest of the rewrites through the rest of the book are going to be fairly easy. 31 was a beast. 31 was a beast. And I can't explain the reasons because it would give too much of the plot away, which I am not willing to do. But uh, suffice it to say, I had like three, four different versions of it up that I was comparing and I was pulling bits out of one bit and putting them in the other and then going, oh my God, did I make put that on the master copy or not? I shouldn't do that until I'm sure, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And um, so... It was days and days of struggle. Days of struggle. Boy, that sounds dramatic. Don't I sound like a, a hard-working guy? Anyway, I finally cracked it, I think, and then spent a few minutes getting the last bit of it done today and then just steamed through the next chapter. Done. And now I'm on to chapter 33. So eh, we're almost there. We're almost there. As I said, this last part will go much faster, I think. I hope. My fingers are crossed. Anyway, what else? Uh, we have continued to have a respite from rains here in California, where many of you are, I know. And uh, you can you can uh, be witnesses to that fact if it's somebody calls me on it and says I'm lying. Um, we have had a respite from rains, at least in my part of California, for the past several days, which has been much valued. We are always thrilled to have water in California, but still, after days and days of, of bucketing downpour, there are a, there comes a point where 
we're okay with having a little dry weather too. And especially when you have a rain phobic dog as we do. So the last few days, Johnny has been able to go out and run around in the yard and, and do his doggy thing, barking away all the dangers, the manifold, manifold amount of burglars and delivery people and crazy pedestrians walking on our street and God knows what are they, you know, night bunnies and murder squirrels and all of Johnny's enemies. He's been able to get out and bark them into uh, inefficacy. So he's in a good mood. Um, because it's been cold weather, the Chihuahua spends all of his time burrowed into somebody. Um, me, Deb, his, his, his boy, who is our oldest. Um, but he's almost always burrowed into somebody. And my dad seems to be settling in okay, which I know people have asked about. Um, the assisted living place that he's in was uh, tragically, well, maybe that's an exaggeration, but un unfortunately they shut down for COVID the day he moved in. So that just, they opened back up again uh, a few days back. And um, so he is able to get out and socialize and meet some of the people he's been living with since a few days after Christmas. So that is a good thing. And as far as we can tell, he's doing okay with that. Um, I say as far as we can tell, uh, my dad is famous for what I refer to as the vagueness index, which can be either moderate to severely high, depending on how vague he's being on any given day. Very smart man. Um, he's not senile. It's not down anything like that. He just is very vague. Um, you ask him almost anything and he's, hmm, hmm, yeah, maybe, you know, that's just kind of his blanket response. So when you say, how are you doing, dad? What you get is, you know, yeah. And that, you get that whether he's in a good mood or a bad mood. It's not that he doesn't want to tell you that he's in a bad mood. It's not one of those I'm fine things that other people do when they don't want to say, actually, I'm miserable. It's just the way he is. It's the vagueness index. So, but as far as we can tell, as far as my readings of the vagueness index can tell anyway, he seems to be doing okay. I just checked in with my brothers and they agreed. So what else is there? Um, nothing, just the, the hideous ongoing embarrassment and shame of technical glitches interfering with the readings, which the people are all very nice about it. The, the people who are here at the readings, like you kind people, are all very, have all been very nice about it. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is my sense of self-worth. My, my belief in myself as somebody who has at least a passing familiarity with modern technology and is able to maneuver my way through most things. Um, however, I'm either I'm doing things just stupid, like I did last night by accidentally shutting off the stream, or I'm just way less informed than I think I am, which is probably the case in most situations. Um, but as long as I move slowly and carefully, I will probably not turn off the stream again tonight. So anyway, I am going to check in and see if I can make any sense out of who has See, there's 21 comments already, and out of them, only four are displayed. And there is no, and now they just all went away when I clicked on them, and it's still only telling me four. So, um, I will just try to say hello based on who is actually on the list of commenters. And I'll assume that being a commenter is, is uh, in this case, is the same as revealing oneself to the outside world. So I will say hello to them. Although I already found that there's two of them I can't say hello to because they're just listed as and two more. Anyway, I see Kelly, top of the list. And hi, Kelly, good to see you. Tim, hello, Tim. Angie, pleasure. Isaac, hello as always. Emily, good to see you. Timothy. Nice to have you with me. That's as opposed to Tim. That's Tim Speckins and Timothy Roberts. Cliff, hello, hello. Hope you and yours are well. Jared, good to see you. Barb, Anne, there you are. Claudia, a pleasure. Tracy, good to see you. Kristen, hello, Kristen. Ray, uh, nice to have you. Medardo, bienvenido. Now it just went away again. I don't know why. Okay. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry, this stuff just cracks me up. It's so unuser friendly. It's just hilarious. Um, 
Who else have I not said hello to yet? Kristen Milardo. Becca. Hello, Becca. Karen. Hello, Karen. Good to see you. Becky, as, a, as opposed to Becca. That's Becca Whirlin. Becky Willems, just to make things even more complicated. Tiffany and Susan. And the ubiquitous two more. Who? So I cannot call you two out by name and say hi, but good to have you. Um, oh, I see maybe that's Christy. I see Christy is not on the list over here that I'm reading from, but I see Christy has actually checked in and said hello. And the same, I believe, is true for Barbara. Yes, so hello to both of you. I'll assume you are the other two. Don't know for certain, but I'm doing the best I can in, with my limited resources. Anyway, so hello. Nice to have you all with me. Um, I am going to start back a little ways because I'm not sure when we lost the stream last night. Um, I just know that, uh, oh, and that's the other thing is because I'm now having to operate from my streaming software into Facebook uh, and Facebook Live. What this means is that the, the, what I'm seeing, the way I can see what I'm doing and making sure that, you know, that everything looks fairly normal is actually like two minutes a ahead of what you guys are hearing. Uh, or seeing. So it's really hard to tell where things, you know, like when something goes wrong, it's really hard to tell where it went wrong. Um, I have to go and try and get the very uncooperative Facebook stuff to allow me to go backward through the, the feed. So anyway, I know you don't need to know any of this. There's not going to be a test. I do not expect anybody to care. Um, as I said, I'm just living in this state of perpetual shame at all these issues, so I'm just explaining what's going on. I'm not ignoring them. I am not uh, just kind of contentedly sitting back and going, well, it's free. Nobody's got a right to complain. I mean, you know, I set out to do this, and I take this stuff seriously. Anyway, okay, so, but anyway, what I was saying is that we, I don't know exactly where we left off last time, except a couple of people mentioned that they had heard mention of the horses. So I'm going to go back to just before um, the horses, <laughs> such as it is. Um, where we are, Simon and Binibic and the uh, other, the mortal soldiers, Haystan, Grimrick, and uh, who's still alive? <laughs> Sludig, of course. Uh, the mortal soldiers, Haystan, Sludig, and Grimrick, who are still alive, they'd already lost uh, one of their company, ha were saved from an attack by the Queen's Huntsman, Ingen Jaeger. And because of that, the Sithi kind of brought them in. It wasn't clear whether they were prisoners or not. But it turns out that the Sithi, who saved them and then sort of captured them, were, are led by Jeriki. And Jeriki, of course, as most of you, if not all of you already know, is the Sitha that Simon had saved from the, the a trap in the forest, from, um, you know, the hanging trap, the, the, what do you call it, springe, I guess. Um, and so once they discovered that, they, they began to realize that they were probably not going to be immediately executed, and they have been hanging out with the... Um, they had been hanging out with the Sithi ever since, and this is now the next day, and uh, Binibic is taking Simon. Uh, Binibic has been having some frustrations with his knuckle bones, which he uses to um, kind of not foretell the future so much as to interrogate the present. Um, it's a bit like the I Ching that way. Um, so anyway, so Binibic is now leading Simon out of the, uh, the cave that they've been staying in, the so-called hunting lodge of the Sitha, who have been hunting giants, as we discovered. And that's what's going on. So, Binibic went first down the ice chute, warning Simon to keep his toes pointed and his hands close to his head. Oh, last thing. Um, because it is not very safe for me to check the comments and because the comments are frustratingly not available to me except in very small batches, I probably won't be going to look at comments. Um, so just so you know that, because that's what I was doing when I accidentally shut the stream off last night. So don't take it personally. It's not that I don't want to hear what you guys have to say. It's that I'm going to have to figure out how to incorporate them back in again. Anyway. 
Binnebick went first down the ice chute, warning Simon to keep his toes pointed and his hands close to his head. The headlong seconds rushing down the tunnel were like a dream of falling from a high place, and when he thumped down into the soft snow beneath the tunnel mouth, bright, chill daylight in his eyes, he was content to sit for a moment and enjoy the feel of his heart's rapid beating. A moment later, he was bowled over by a surprising clout on the back, followed by the smothering descent of a mountain of muscle and fur. Kantaka, he heard Binnebick shout, laughing. If it is your friends who are receiving such treatment, I am glad I am no enemy. Simon pushed the wolf away, gasping, only to face a renewed, rough-tongued assault on his face. At last, with Binnebick's aid, he rolled free. Kentaka sprang to her feet, whining excitedly, circled the youth and troll once, then sprang away into the snowy wood. Now, Binnebick said, brushing snow from his black hair, we must be finding where the Sithi have been putting up our horses. Not far, Kanuk man. Simon jumped. He turned to see a line of Sithi file silently out of the trees, Jeriki's green-jacketed uncle at its head. And why do you seek them? Binnebick smiled. Certainly not for escaping you, good Kendrajaro. Your hospitality is too lavish for us to hurry away from it. No, there are certain things only I wish to make sure we still have. Things I was obtaining with some trouble at Naglamund that we will need on the roads ahead. Kendra Jaro looked down on the troll expressionlessly for a moment, then signaled to two of the other Sithi. Sijandi, Kyoshapo, show them. The yellow-haired pair walked a few steps along the hillside, away from the tunnel mouth, then stopped, waiting for Simon and the troll to follow. When Simon looked back, he saw Kendra Jaro still watching, an unreadable expression in his bright, narrowed eyes. They found the horses put up a few furlongs away in a small cavern hidden by a pair of snow-laden pine trees. The cave was snug and dry, all six horses were contentedly chewing away at a pile of sweet-smelling hay. Where did all this come from? Simon asked, surprised. We often bring our own horses, Kyushapo replied, speaking the western tongue carefully. Does it surprise you to find we have uh, a stable for them? As Binnebick rooted around in one of the saddlebags, Simon explored the cavern, noting the light spilling through a crevice high in the wall and a stone trough filled with clean water. Propped against the far side was a pile of helmets, axes, and swords. Simon recognized one of the blades as his own, from the armory of Naglamund. These are ours, Binnebick, he said. How, how did they get here? Kyushapo spoke slowly, as though to a child. We put them here after we took them from you and your companions. Here they are safe and dry. Simon looked at the Sitha suspiciously. But I thought that you couldn't touch iron, that it was poison to you. He stopped short, fearful that he had ventured onto forbidden ground, but Kyushapo only exchanged a glance with his silent companion before replying, so, you have heard tales of the days of Black Iron, he said. Yes, it was once thus, but those of us who survived those days have learned much. We know now what waters to drink and from which certain springs, so that we can handle mortal iron for a little time without harm. Why did you think we allowed you to keep your coat of mail, but, of course, we have no liking for it, and do not use it, or, or even touch, when there is no need. He looked over to Binnebeck, who was still rummaging intently in the traveling bags. We shall leave you to finish your search, the Sitha said. You will find nothing missing, at least nothing you had when you came into our hands. Binnebeck looked up. Uh, of course... He said, I am only in worry over 
things that may have been lost during the fighting of yesterday. Of course, Kishapo and the quiet Sajandi went out beneath the branches of the entrance. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah! Binibik said at last, holding up a sack that clinked like a purse full of gold imperators. A worry eased, this is. He dropped it back into the saddlebag. What is it? Simon asked, irritated to be asking yet another question. Binibik grinned wickedly. More canop tricks, ones that will be found very useful soon. Come, we should be returning. If the others wake up, stiff with drink and alone, they may have fright and be doing something foolish. Kantaka found them on their short journey back, her mouth and nose daubed with the blood of some luckless animal. She bounded several times around them, then stopped, hackles lifting as she sniffed at the air. She lowered her head and sniffed again, then went loping ahead. Chiriki and Anai had joined Kendra Jarl. The prince had shed his white robe for a jacket of tan and blue. He held a tall bow, unstrung, and wore a quiver of full. He held a tall bow, unstrung, and wore a quiver of full of brown fletched arrows. Kantaka circled the Sithi, growling and sniffing, but her tail waved in the air behind her as though she greeted old acquaintances. She lunged forward toward the blithe fair folk, then dodged back rumbling deep in her throat and shaking her head as though snapping the, red, the neck of a rabbit. When Binibic and Simon joined the circle, she came forward long enough to touch Binibic's hand with her black nose, then danced away again and resumed her nervous circling. Did you find all your possessions in good order? Jariki asked. Binibic nodded. Yes, with certainty. Thanks to you for seeing to our horses. Jariki negligently waved his slender hand. And what now to do? he asked. I am thinking we should be on our road soon, the troll responded, shading his eyes to look at the gray-blue sky. Surely not this day, Jariki said. Rest this afternoon and eat with us again. We still have much to speak of, and you can leave tomorrow by dawn light. You and your uncle show much kindness to us, Prince Jiriki, and honor, Binibik bowed. We are not a kind race, Binbinakega Binik, not as we once were, but we are a courteous one. Come. After a splendid lunch of bread, sweet milk, and a wonderfully odd tangy soup made from nuts and snow flowers, the long afternoon was spent by Sithi and men alike in quiet talk and singing and long naps. Simon slept shallowly and dreamed of Miriamel standing atop the ocean as though it were a floor of uneven green marble, beckoning him to come to her. In his dream, he saw furious black clouds on the horizon and called out, trying to give warning. The princess did not hear over the gathering wind, only smiled and beckoned. He knew he could not stand on the waves and dove in to swim toward her, but he felt the cold waters pulling him down, tugging him under. When he fought free of the dream at last, it was to awaken in dying afternoon. The pillars of light had dimmed and leaned as though drunken. Some of the Sithi were setting the crystal lamps in their wall niches, but even watching the process gave Simon no better understanding of what lit them. After being put in place, they simply, slowly, began to glow with gentle, suffusive light. Simon joined his companions at the stone circle around the fire. They were alone. The Sithi, although hospitable and even friendly, nevertheless seemed to prefer their own company, sitting in small knots around the cavern. Boy, Haystan said, reaching up to clasp it, to clap his shoulder, we feared you'd sleep all the day. I would sleep too if I ate as much bread as he, Sludig said, cleaning his nails with a sliver of wood. 
All here were agreeing on an early leave-taking. Tomorrow, Benevick said, and Grimrick and Haystan nodded. There is no certainty this mildness of weather will continue long, and it is far we must still go. Mild weather, said Simon, frowning at the stiffness in his legs as he sat down. It's snowing like mad. Benevick chuckled deep in his throat. Ah! Oh. Friend Simon, talk to a snow dweller if you are wanting to know cold weather. This, this is like our Canuck spring when we play naked in the snows of Mintahawk. When we are reaching the mountains, then, I am sorry to say, you will be feeling real coldness. He doesn't look very sorry at all, Simon thought. So when do we start out? First light in the east, Sludig said. The sooner, he added significantly, looking around the cavern at their unusual hosts, the better. Binnebick eyed him, then turned back to Simon. So we shall be at putting things in order tonight. Jeriki had appeared as though from thin air to join them at the fireside. Ah, he said. I wish to speak to you about just these matters. Surely there is no problem had with our leaving? Binnebeck asked, his cheerful expression not entirely masking a certain anxiousness. Haystan and Grimrick looked worried, Sludig ever so faintly resentful. I think not, the Sitha replied. But there are certain things I wish to send with you. He reached a long-fingered hand into his robe, and, with a fluid gesture, produced Simon's white arrow. "'This is yours, Saoman, he said. "'What? But it b belongs to you, Prince Jeriki.' The Sitha, the Sitha lifted his head for a moment, as though listening to some distant call, then lowered his gaze once more. "'No, Saoman, it is not mine.' until I earn it back, a life for a life. He held it up between his two hands like a length of string so that the slanting light from above burnished the minute and complicated designs along its length. I know you cannot read these writings, Jeriki said slowly, but I will tell you what they are. They are words of making, scribed on the arrow by Vindameo the Fletcher himself, deep, deep in the past, before we of the first people were torn apart into three tribes. It is as much a part of my family as if it were made with my own bone and sinew, and as much a part of me. I did not give it lightly. Few mortals have ever held Astaja Ame, and I certainly could not take it back until I had paid the debt it signifies. So saying, he handed it to Simon, whose fingers trembled as they touched the arrow's smooth barrel. I, I didn't understand, he stammered, feeling as if he were the one suddenly under obligation. He shrugged, unable to say more. So, Tariki turned to Binnebeck and the others, my destiny, as you mortals might have it, seems strangely bound with this man-child. You will not then find it too surprising when I tell you what else I would send along with you on your unusual and probably fruitless errand. After a moment, Binnebeck asked, And what is that being, Jiriki? He smiled, a feline, self-satisfied smile. Myself, he answered. I will go with you. new section. The young pikeman stood long seconds, unsure of whether to interrupt the prince's thoughts. Joshua was staring out into the middle distance, knuckles white as he clutched the parapet of Naglamon's western wall. At last, the prince seemed to notice the foreign presence. He turned, revealing a face so unnaturally pale that the soldier took a half step back. Your highness, he asked, finding it hard to look into Joshua's eyes. 
The prince's stare, the soldier thought, was like that of the wounded fox he'd once seen the, seen the hounds take and tear before it was dead. Send me Dernoth, the prince said, and forced himself to smile, which the young soldier thought the most horrible thing of all. And send me the old man, Yarnauga, the Rimmersman. Do you know him? I, I think so, your highness, with uh, the one-eyed father in book room. Good man. Jaswa's face tilted toward the sky, watching the mass of inky clouds as though they were a book of prophecy. The pikeman hesitated, unsure of whether he was dismissed, then turned to sidle off. You, man, the prince said, stopping him in mid-step. Your highness, what is your name? He might have been asking the sky. Austral, highness, Austral first from son. Lord, out Runchester? The prince looked over briefly, then his gaze flicked back to the darkening horizon as though irresistibly drawn. When were you last home in Runchester, my good man? Leisure Mansa for last, Prince Joshua, but I send him half my gettings, Lord. The prince pulled his high collar closer and nodded his head as though at great wisdom. Very well, then. Austral, first from son, go and send Dernoth and Yarnauga. Go now. Long before this day, the young pikeman had been told that the prince was half mad as he clomped down the gatehouse stairs in his heavy boots. He thought of Joshua's face, remembering with a shiver the bright ecstatic eyes of painted martyrs in his family's Book of the Adon, and not only the singing martyrs, but also the weary sadness of Eusiris himself led in chains to the execution tree. And the scouts are certain, Highness, Dernoth asked carefully. He did not want to give offense, but he sensed a wildness in the prince today that he did not understand. God's tree, Dernoth, of course they are certain. You know them both, dependable men. The High King is at the Greenwayed Ford less than ten leagues away. He'll be before the walls by tomorrow morning, with considerable strength. So, Leobardus is too slow. Deonoth squinted his eyes, looking not south, where Elias's armies crept inexorably nearer, but west, where somewhere beyond the late morning mist, the legions of the Kingfisher were laboring across the Innis Creek and the southern Frost March. Barring a miracle, the prince said. Go to, Dernoth. Tell Sir Edgram to hold all in readiness. I want every spear sharp, every bow tight strung, and not a drop of wine in the gatehouse, or in the gatekeepers. Understood? Of course, Highness. Dernoth nodded. He felt a quickening of his breath, a slightly sickening thrill of anticipation in his stomach. By the merciful... God, they would give the High King a taste of Naglam and honor. He knew they would. Someone cleared his throat warningly. It was Yarnauga scaling the stairs up to the broad walkway as effortlessly as a man half his age. He wore one of Strangyard's loose black robes and had tucked the end of his long beard under the belt. I answer your summons, Prince Jaswa, he said, stiffly courteous. Thank you, Yarnauga, Jazo replied. Go on, Dernoth. I will talk with you at supper. Yes, Highness. Dernoth bowed, helmet in hand, then was gone down the stairway, two steps at a time. Jazo waited some moments after he was gone to speak. Look there, old man, look, he said at last, sweeping his arms sweeping his arm out over the clutter of Naglaman town and the meadows and farm farmland beyond, the greens and yellows dark painted by the glowering sky. The rats are coming to gnaw at our walls. We will not see this untroubled view for a long time, if ever. Elias's approach is the talk of the castle, Joshua, as it should be. The prince, as if he had drunk his fill of the sights before him, turned his back to the parapet and fixed the bright-eyed old man with his own intense stare. 
Did you see his Grimner off? Yes, he was not pleased to be leaving in secret and before dawn. Well, what else could be done? After we put about the story of his mission to Perdruin, it would have been difficult if anyone had seen him go in priest's robes and as beardless as when he was a boy in Elvertsala. The prince forced a grim, clenched-jawed smile. God knows, Yarnauga, though I made sport of his disguising myself. It is a knife in my guts to have pulled that good man from his family and sent him out to try and recover my own failing. You are master here, Joshua. Sometimes being master means less of some kinds of freedom than that given to the meanest serf. The prince tucked his right arm into his cloak. Did he take Kvalnir? Yarnauga grinned. Sheathed beneath his outer robe. May your god save the one who tries to rob that fat old monk. The prince's tired, tired smile widened for a moment. But even God, them, god himself won't be able to help them in the mood his Grimner's in. The smile did not outlast the moment. Now, Yarnauga, walk with me here on the battlements. I need your good eyes and wise words. I can indeed look farther than most, Yasua. So my father taught me and my mother. That is why I am named Iron Eyes in our Rimaspak. I was taught to see through the veils of deception as black iron cuts spades. But as to the other, I can promise no wisdom worthy of the name at this late hour. The prince made a dismissive gesture. You have helped us already, I suspect, to see much we would not have. Tell me of this League of the Scroll. Did they send you to Tungle Deer to spy on Stormspike? The old man fell in at Joshua's side, his sleeves fluttering like black pennants. No, prince, that is not the League's way. My father, too, was a scroll bearer. He lifted a golden chain out of the neck of his vestments, showing Joshua a carved quill and scroll that hung upon it. He raised me to take up his place, and I would have done no less to please him. The League does not compel. It asks only that one does what one can do. Joshua walked silently, thinking. If only a land could be so ruled he said at last, if only men would do what they should. He turned his thoughtful gray-eyed stare to the old Rimmersman. But things are not always so easy. The wrong and right not always so apparent. Surely this league of yours must have its high priest or its prince. Was that Morgenes? Yarnauga quirked his lips. There are indeed times when it would benefit us to have a leader, a strong hand. Our woeful unpreparedness for these events shows that. Yarnauga shook his head. And we would have granted such leadership to Dr. Morgenes in an instant if he had asked. Oh, he was a man of incredible wisdom, Joshua. I hope that you appreciated him when you knew him. But he would not have it. He wanted only to search and to read and to ask questions. Still, thank whatever powers that we had him as long as we did. His foresight is at this moment our only shield. Joshua stopped, leaning with his elbows on the parapet. So this league of yours has never had a leader. Not since King Elstan Fiskern your Saint Elstan brought it together. He paused, remembering. There almost was one, and within my time, he was a young Hernestir man, another of Morgenes' discoverers. He had nearly Morgenes' skill, or, or though less caution, so that he studied things Morgenes would not. He had ambitions and argued that we should make ourselves more of a force for good. He might have one day been the leader you speak of, Joshua, 
a man of great wisdom and strength. When the old man did not continue, Joshua looked over to see Yarnauga's eyes fixed on the western horizon. What happened? the prince asked. Is he dead? No, Yarnauga answered slowly, eyes still drawn out across the rolling plain. No, I do not think so. He changed. Something frightened him or hurt him or or something. He left us long ago. So you do have failures, Joshua said, starting to walk again. The old man did not follow. Oh, certainly, he said, lifting his hand as if to shade his brow, staring out into the dim distance. Priorities was one of ours once, too. Before the prince could reply to this, he was interrupted. Joshua! Someone cried from the courtyard. The lines around the prince's mouth tightened. Lady Vorsheva, he said, turning to look down to where she stood, indignantly in a dress of gleaming red, hair a swirl in the wind like black smoke. Towser skulked uncomfortably at her side. What would you of me? the prince demanded. You should be in the keep. As a matter of fact, I order you to the keep. I have been there, she called crossly. Lifting the hem of her dress, she ankled toward the stairway, talking as she went. And I will soon go back. Do not worry. But first I must one time more see the sun. Or would you rather keep me in a black cell? Despite his exasperation, Joshua was hard-pressed to keep his face entirely stern. Heaven knows that there are windows in the keep, lady. He lowered his frown to Towser. Can you not at least keep her off the walls, Towser? Soon we are at siege. The little man shrugged and limped up the stairs after Vorsheva. Show me the armies of your terrible brother, she said, a little breathless as she reached the prince's side. If his armies were here, you would not be, Joshua said irritably. There is nothing to see yet. Now please go down. Joshua? Yarnago was still squinting into the cloudy west. I think there is perhaps something to see. What? In an instant, the prince was beside the old rimmersman, his body pitched awkwardly against the parapet as he strained to find what the man saw. Is it Elias? So soon? I see nothing. He slapped his palm on the stone in frustration. I doubt it is the high king coming from so westerly a direction, Yarnauga said. Do not be surprised you do not see them. As I told you, I was trained to look where others could not. Nevertheless, they are there, many horses and men, too far away still to guess how many, coming toward us. There, he pointed. Praise you, Cyrus, Joshua said, excited. You must be right. It can only be Leobardus. He straightened up, suddenly full of life, even as his face clouded with worry. This is delicate, he said, half to himself. The Nabani must not come too close, else they will be useless to us, caught between Elias and the walls of Naglamon. Then we shall have to bring them in, where they will just be more mouths to feed. He strode for the stairs. If they stay too far, we will not be able to protect them when Elias turns on them. No, we must send riders. He went down the stairs at a bound, shouting for Dernoth and Edgram, the Lord Constable of Naglamond. Oh, Towser, Vorsheva said, her cheeks flushed with the wind and the pace of events. We shall be saved after all. Everything will be better. Just as well with me, my lady. Jester responded, I've been through this all before with my master John, you know, and I'm not anxious to do it again. Soldiers were cursing and shouting now in the castle courtyard below. Joshua stood on the rim of the well, his slender sword in his hand, calling instructions. 
The sound of metal on metal as spear butts clanged on shields and helmets and swords were hurriedly taken from the corners where they had been laid, rose past the walls like an invocation. Count Aspidus Previs exchanged a few terse words with Benagoras, then pulled his horse up beside the dukes, matching him stride for stride through the high, dewy grass. The dawn sun was a shining smudge above the gray horizon. Young Aspidus, Leobardus said heartily, what news? If he and his son were to be on better terms, he must try to show kindness to Benagoras's intimates even to Aspidus, whom he considered one of the Praven House's less impressive products. The scouts have just rejoined us, my lord duke. The count, a handsome slender youth, was quite pale. We are less than five leagues from the walls of Naglumen, my lord. Good. With luck we shall be there in early afternoon. But Elias is ahead of us. Aspidus looked over to the duke's son, who shook his head and cursed beneath his breath. He has already laid the siege in strength? Leobardus asked, surprised. How? Has he learned to make his armies fly? Well, no, lord, it is not Elias. Aspidus hurried to amend himself. It is a large force. <coughs> it is a large force riding beneath the flag of the boar and spears. Earl Guthwolf of Utenyate's banner. They have half a league or so on us and will keep us from the gates. The duke shook his head, relieved. How many does Guthwolf have? Perhaps a hundred horse, my lord, but the high king cannot be too far behind. Well, little should we care, Leobardus said, reining up at the edge of one of the many small streams that crisscrossed the meadowlands east of Greenwade. Let the High King's hand and his troop languish there. We are more used to Joshua at a short distance, where we can harry the besiegers and keep the lines of supply open. With a splash, he rode down into the ford. Benegaris and the Count spurred after him. But, Father, Benegaris said, catching up, think now. Our scouts say Gothwolf has moved ahead of the King's army. And with only a hundred knights. Spidus Previs nodded confirmation, and Benegaris drew his dark brows together in a frown of earnestness. We have twice that, and if we send fast riders ahead, we can muster Joshua's forces too. We could smash Guthwolf against Naglamund's walls, as between hammer and anvil. He grinned and clapped his father's armored shoulder. Think! How that would sit with King Elias. Make him think twice, wouldn't it? Leobardus rode silently for a long minute. He looked back at the rippling banners of his legions, stretching back several furlongs across the meadows. The sun had, for a moment, found a, shine, a thinner spot in the overcast, bringing color to the wind-bowed grass. It reminded him of the lake lands east of his palace. Call the trumpeter, he said, and Aspidus turned and shouted an order. hey -ah! I'll send riders ahead to Naglamon, father, Benegara said, smiling almost with relief. The duke could see how much his son longed for glory, but it would be Naban's glory, too. Pick your fastest riders, my son, he called as Benegara rode back through the lines, for we shall move more swiftly than anyone dreams we can. He raised his voice to a great shout, turning heads all through the field. The legions shall ride for Naban and Mother Church. Let our enemies beware. Benegaris returned shortly to pronounce the messengers dispatched. Duke Leobardus let the trumpets ring out, then sound again and the great army set out at speed. Their hoofbeats sounded, rolling like rapid drumbeats in the meadow dells as they passed out of the Innescrick. The sun rose in the muddy morning sky, and the banner streamed blue and gold. The kingfisher flew to Naglamund. 
Joshua was still pulling on his unadorned, bright polished helm as he went through the gate at the head of two score mounted knights. The harper Sang Fugel ran alongside, holding something up to him. The prince reined in and slowed his horse to a walk. What, man? he asked impatiently, scanning the misty horizon. The harper struggled for breath. It is your father's banner, Prince Joshua, he said, passing it up. Brought out of the hayhold. You carry no standard but Naglaman's gray swan. What better one for yourself could you wish? The prince stared at the red and white pennant, half unfolded in his lap. The fire drake's eye glared sternly, as if some interloper threatened the sacred tree about which it had enwrapped itself. Dernoth and Izorn, with a few of the other knights nearby, smiled expectantly. No, said Joshua, handing it back. His look was cold. I am not my father, and I am no king. He turned, wrapping the reins around his right arm and lifted his hand. Forward, he shouted. We go to meet friends and allies. He and his troop rode down through the sloping streets of the town. A few flowers thrown by well-wishers from atop the castle walls fluttered into the churned, muddy roadway behind them. "'What do you see there, Remmersman?' Towser demanded, frowning. "'Why are you mumbling so?' Joshua's small force was now only a colorful blur fast disappearing in the distance. "'There is a troop of mounted men coming along the rim of the hills to the south,' Jan Auga said. It looks from here not a large army, but they are still distant. He closed his eyes for a moment, as if trying to remember something, then reopened them, staring into the distance. Hang on, I'm just checking something, and I want to make sure I am not accidentally ending the stream. <laughs> Can you tell that I'm a little bit, a little bit traumatized, just a little bit? Um, where were we? It looks from here not a large army, but they are still distant. He closed his eyes for a moment as if trying to remember something, then reopened them, staring. Towser reflexively made the sign of the tree. The old Rimmersman's eyes were so bright and shone so fiercely, like lamps of sapphire. A boar's head on crossed spears, Yanauga hissed. Whose is it? Guthwolf, Towser said, confused. The Rimmersman might have been watching phantoms for all the horizon revealed to the old jester. Earl of Oatniate, the, the king's hand. Farther down the wall, the Lady Vorsheva stared wistfully after the prince's vanishing horsemen. He comes from the south, then, ahead of Elias's full army. It looks as though Leobardus has seen him. The Nabani have turned toward the southern hills, as though to engage him. How, how many, how many men? Towser asked, feeling ever more muddled. How can you see such a thing now? I see nothing, and my sight's the one thing that hasn't... A hundred knights, perhaps fewer, Yarnau interrupted. That is what is troubling. Why are they so few? Merciful God, what is the duke up to? Joshua swore, rising in his stirrups to gain better vantage. He's turned east and is galloping full tilt toward the southern hills. Has he lost his wits? My lord, look! Deirnoth shouted across to him. Look there, on the skirts of Bullback Hill. By the love of the Adon, it's the king's army. What is Leobardus doing? Does he think to attack Elias unsupported? Joshua slapped his horse's neck and spurred forward. It looks a small force only, Prince Joshua, called Dernoth. An advance party, perhaps. Why didn't he send riders? The prince asked plaintively. Look, they will try and push them toward Naglaman to trap them against the wall. Why, in God's name, did Leobardus not send riders to me? He sighed and turned to Izorn, who had pushed his father's bare helm back from his brow to better scan the horizon. Now we will have our metal tested after all, friend. 
the inevitability of fighting seemed to have drawn serenity over Joswell like a mantle. His eyes were calm, and he wore an odd half-smile. Izorn grinned over at Dernoff, who was loosening his shield from his saddle pommel, then looked back to the prince. "'Let them test it, lord,' said the duke's son. "'Ride on!' the prince shouted. "'The despoiler of Utenyed is before us. Ride!' So crying, he spurred his piebald charger into a gallop, making the sod spurt beneath the horse's hooves. For Naglamund, Bernoth shouted, lifting his sword high. For Naglamund and our prince! Gatwulf is standing fast, Yarnauga said. He holds on the hillside, even as the Nabanai come against him. Jaswa has turned to meet them. They are fighting? Forsheva asked, frightened. What is happening to the prince? He has not reached the battle. There, Yarnaga was striding down the wall toward the southwestern turret. Gothwulf's knights take the first charge of the Nabanai. Why, it is all confusion. He squinted and knuckled his eyes. What? What? Towser put a finger in his mouth, staring and gnawing. Do not go silent on me, Rimmersman. It is hard to make out what happens from this far, said Yarnauga, unnecessarily, for neither of his two companions nor anyone else on the castle walls could see anything but a faint smear of movement in the shadow of misty Bullback Hill. The prince bears down on the fighting, and Leobardus's and Gothwulf's knights are scattered among along the hill slopes. Now, now, he trailed off, concentrating. Ah, said Towser in disgust, slapping his skinny thigh. By St. Murfath and the Archangel, this is worse than anything I can think of. I might as well read this in a book. Damn you, man, speak. And I think I'm going to stop there because there's still a few pages left that I'm not going to get to tonight. So I think that's a good place to stop. With Towser saying, I might as well read this in a book. Because, you know, how more frustrating could it be? And it's so bad that you wish you were reading a book instead. Um, anyway, so we are now crawling to the top of the hour. It's a few minutes before eight. Now that I'm not so worried about losing the stream, maybe I can go and see if there's actually any comments I need to respond to. Okay, um, as usual, now it'll only give me two or three comments at a time, but everybody seems to be acting normal, so I'm assuming we did not lose our feed. That alone is such a major, major moral victory um, that I am just thrilled. I will, I will sleep well tonight. <laughs> Probably with two large, one large and one small dog wedged into me. Because um, that's what they do on cold nights, even when it's not cold in the house. They just seem to sense. They have an ex uh, a concept of the external world. Well, I guess they do go out during the day, but they, uh, they definitely get <coughs> hunkered right in when it's cold. Anyway, so with that, I will thank you all for joining me. I will, as far as I know, um, barring acts of God or of gods, um, I will be back next week. Um, I will see if we can get through an entire reading for the 1 o'clock, the 1 a.m. crowd. And then, of course, I will be back at 7 p.m. When I actually complete a reading, of course, they are available on my social media. Although at the moment, um, it seems that, uh, as far as I can tell, that Twitter has turned off the ability to link to another social media uh, platform which is petty and irritating, but there you are. So whatever people have been finding their way to me through Twitter, we'll have to find another way to do it. Uh, if you're seeing this on YouTube, um, I keep my Facebook pages um, open to the public. So you should be able to just open Facebook and go to my page, uh, Tad Williams, either Tad Williams author or just Tad Williams me. You will know the Tad Williams author page because it's got a picture of me. You will know the regular Tad Williams page because it's got a picture of something weird because I change my profile pictures every day. So if you see um, 
dolls, weird masks, uh, alien beings, monkeys, you know, whatever it is, it's probably me. I mean, it says Tad Williams, but it, it's probably me if it has a picture of a monkey or something. Um, and so you should be able to just watch them live if that's what you want to do. And post comments as well. The problem in the moment being I can't read the comments. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. So with that, I say once again, thank you so much for joining me. It is a pleasure as always to spend time with you virtually or otherwise. Be good to yourselves. Be good to those around you. Remember, we're not through the pandemic yet. And there's all kinds of other things to be careful about and to help people out with and to be aware of the state of those around us. So take care of yourself, take care of your loved ones, take care of your friends and neighbors to the best of your ability. And we will all get through all of this together. And that's really the best way to do it. So peace. Thank you for joining me and I will see you next week.